Welcome, I'm Nan Jokerst, and this is our in-depth video about photolithography. The term photolithography is used to describe a process in which we use light to print or pattern the surface of a substrate or a metal or dielectric on the substrate. This type of patterning is used a great deal when we make devices, interconnections, and structures. For example, the metal interconnect structures on an integrated circuit are very complex and often use over 10 different layers of patterned metal. There are two types of lithography or patterning that we'll discuss in this course, photolithography and electron beam lithography. In this video, we will talk about photolithography, which uses light to transfer a pattern to a substrate. First, we identify what pattern we want to make on our substrate. For example, we might want to pattern a layer of metal that has been deposited onto a silicon substrate, as shown here. If there are devices such as transistors in the silicon, then we, we might want to pattern the metal interconnect to connect the transistors in a certain pattern to make a circuit. A key component in photolithography is the photomask, or mask, that has the pattern we want to transfer to the wafer. A photomask is a transparent plate, usually glass or quartz, that has a thin metal pattern. The mask is transparent to light everywhere, but where the metal lies on the mask. This metal will block the light that patterns the substrate, and so the metal is the pattern that we transfer to the substrate. How do we make a photo mask? Well, photo masks are designed by you, the user, on a computer, usually using a computer-aided design or CAD drawing program. Then, we send the computer file to a commercial photo mask vendor, and the mask is fabricated by the supplier and shipped to us within a few days. Here's an example of a photo mask. Photo mask sizes vary depending upon the size of your substrate. On this photo mask, we can see that the thin metal forms a very complex pattern. Some regions are transparent, while other regions have the metal film that make them opaque. To transfer the pattern from our mask onto the wafer, we use a thin polymer film that is sensitive to light. When the polymer is exposed to light through our mask, the polymer is patterned by the light. This light-sensitive polymer is called photoresist. The particular type of photolithography that we will discuss is called contact photolithography. Contact photolithography is typically used to pattern shapes that are as large as a few centimeters in size down to about one micrometer, or we say one micron. To start the process, the wafer is first coated with a thin layer of this polymer photoresist using a process known as spin coating. Spin coating is accomplished by depositing a few milliliters of liquid polymer onto the substrate and spinning the substrate at high speeds. Usually 3,000 revolutions per minute is common, and we spin for 30 seconds to one minute. This spinning process causes the liquid polymer to spread evenly over the wafer, forming a uniform, thin photoresist film. This is important for high yield of our transferred pattern across the entire substrate because the uniformity of that photoresist thickness across the entire substrate will ensure that our pattern is transferred accurately across the entire wafer. The wafer and photoresist coating are then heated on a hot plate for one minute to a temperature of about 100 degrees Celsius. Note, however, that there are many types of photoresist and it's important to follow the instructions for your particular photoresist. Now let's take a closer look at the substrate coated with photoresist. Here's a close-up cross-sectional view of the substrate and photoresist. The photoresist thickness may range from a fraction of a micron to 10 or 20 microns or more, depending upon the desired process, while the substrate thickness is usually several hundred microns. To transfer our pattern from the mask to the photoresist, we use a tool called a mask aligner to position the mask at the right place with respect to the substrate 
and to illuminate the photoresist with ultraviolet light, also called UV light. These two steps are referred to as alignment and UV exposure. Here's a photo of a mask aligner. The mask aligner is very important because it allows us to position many pattern layers of material with each layer aligned to each other as they are patterned and we build up a multi-layer structure. Now that our substrate is coated with photoresist, we bring the mask into contact with the photoresist after it's aligned using the mask aligner. We then illuminate the mask from above with ultraviolet light. The UV light passes through the transparent glass portions of the photo mask and the areas of the photo mask containing metal will block the UV light. So we're essentially casting a shadow onto the photoresist where the shape of the shadow is defined by the pattern on our photo mask. The portions of the photoresist that are exposed to the UV light will undergo a chemical change that's indicated here with dotted white lines. Remember, photoresist is sensitive to light. So this light-induced chemical change creates a pattern in the photoresist. Now we remove the mask and the substrate from the mask aligner. We have what's called an exposed substrate. That is, the substrate and photoresist have undergone that UV light exposure and the photoresist is chemically altered in our desired pattern. The next step involves submerging the exposed substrate into a chemical bath known as developer. The developer dissolves the photoresist that was exposed to UV light, but it does not dissolve the photoresist that was not exposed to UV light. So this process is called the develop step and usually takes about one minute. We then remove the substrate from the developer, rinse the substrate with deionized water and blow it dry with nitrogen gas. Our substrate needs to be really clean for high yield. Deionized water is specifically filtered, high purity water used in many chemical processes. Using DI water eliminates trace minerals in water that would act as contaminants to our sensitive chemical processes. Drying with pressurized nitrogen gas ensures that no water remains on our substrate surface. Now we have a photoresist pattern on our substrate. The thin photoresist film contains the same pattern that was on our photo mask. But photoresist is typically only a temporary layer. The pattern photoresist is not permanent, but rather we are going to use it to perform some other processing steps. These steps combined with photolithography are those that are used to make permanent pattern features on our substrate. Let's look at an example of how we can use photoresist patterning to make a permanent pattern on a silicon substrate. An example of such a process is as follows. We start with our silicon substrate as shown here. Then we vacuum deposit a layer of gold as shown here. Then we perform the photolithography steps just described. So then we have a pattern of photoresist on top of our gold. We then place this sample in a liquid acid that etches the gold but does not harm the photoresist and only the exposed gold is etched. Then we remove the remaining photoresist, leaving only the gold pattern on the silicon, as shown here. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Thank you for joining me today. Hello, I'm Nan Jokerst at Duke University, and I'll be joined in this video by PhD student Corrine. Hi, Nan. <laughs> in this video, Corrine will demonstrate the photolithography process, which we use to transfer patterns onto layers on a sample for feature sizes that range from roughly centimeters to microns. I will go through the process steps for photolithography, and I'll demonstrate how to use photolithography to transfer a pattern to a silicon substrate. The photolithography equipment is located in the clean room, so let's get gowned up and head into the clean room. 
Before we begin, you may be wondering about the lighting in this room. Why does the light look amber in color? Well, the polymers used in photolithography are sensitive to shorter wavelength light, that is, blue light and ultraviolet light. These light-sensitive polymers are called photoresists, or simply resists for short. Short wavelength ultraviolet light, also called UV light, is used to expose photoresists during patterning, but we must avoid unwanted exposure from room light. So we use special lights that do not emit shorter wavelength light, and this light appears amber in color. That's why the lighting of this room appears different from typical room lighting. Let's get started with our photolithography process. First, we choose a substrate. In this case, we will be using a silicon wafer. Silicon is the most common semiconductor material used in the electronics industry. This particular wafer is 100 millimeters in diameter and approximately 500 micrometers thick. For this demonstration, we will pattern the wafer using photolithography and then permanently transfer that pattern to the silicon using an etching technique. To pattern the silicon using photolithography, our first process step is to coat the wafer with photoresist using the spin coating technique. The photoresist is a temporary layer that we use to transfer our pattern onto the substrate. This is the spin coder we will be using. The spin coder has a small platform called a spin chuck that will hold our wafer. The spin chuck is hollow in the center and a vacuum line provides suction that holds the wafer securely in place. We place the wafer on the spin chuck, taking care to get the wafer nicely centered. If the wafer is poorly centered, it will not spin smoothly and could result in an uneven photoresist film, or at worst, the wafer could fall off the spin chuck and get damaged during the high speed spinning process. With the wafer centered, we turn on the vacuum to hold the wafer in place. We program the spin coder controller with the spin speed and time we wish to use. In this example, we will spin the wafer at 3000 RPM for 30 seconds. These values are typical for many photoresists. The recommended spin speed and time for a photoresist can be found in the data sheet for that particular resist. This information is often available on the product's website. We are now ready to spin the photoresist. We use a small plastic pipette to take a few milliliters of photoresist from the bottle. Next, we pipette the photoresist onto the wafer, right in the middle. It takes some practice to do this correctly. It's important to smoothly squeeze out most of the photoresist, leaving a small amount in the pipette. If you squeeze out 100% of the photoresist, you will create small bubbles in the photoresist on the wafer, which can cause non-uniformities in the film during the spinning process. With the photoresist on the substrate, we press start on the controller to begin the spinning process. The wafer quickly spins to 3000 RPM. It will spin for 30 seconds as we programmed it, then slow to a stop. After spinning the photoresist, we remove the wafer from the spin coder and bake the wafer on a hot plate at 115 degrees Celsius for one minute. The bake time and temperature can vary depending on the photoresist being used. The bake removes any remaining solvent from the liquid resist and solidifies it into a solid thin polymer film. This particular resist forms a polymer film that is 1.5 micrometers thick. For comparison, the width of a human hair is about 100 micrometers. So this film is quite thin. After the one minute bake, we are now ready to pattern the wafer. To pattern the wafer, we use a photolithography tool. This tool holds the wafer in place, aligns and contacts the photo mask to the wafer, and illuminates the photo mask and substrate with ultraviolet light. Let's go through these steps now. First, we program the desired exposure time into the instrument. Different processes require different exposure times. The exposure time is the amount of time we will illuminate the wafer with UV light. For this example, we will use 11.5 seconds. Next, we put our photo mask into the instrument. The photo mask contains the pattern we wish to transfer to our substrate. Here, we see the pattern on the photo mask, and looking under a microscope, we can see the pattern more clearly. We place the photo mask on the plate. Small holes in the plate lead to a vacuum line that provides suction to firmly hold the photo mask in place. 
We then carefully take the plate and slide it into the instrument. The plate locks into place. We take our wafer that is coated with photoresist and place it onto the wafer platform. Again, vacuum suction holds the wafer in place. We slide the platform into place. With the photo mask installed and the wafer in place, we are ready to start the exposure process. We will start the process by pressing exposure on the instrument. At this point, the instrument automatically raises the wafer so that it gently makes contact with the photo mask. The UV light source will then illuminate the wafer for the programmed amount of time, 11.5 seconds for this example. You'll notice the color of the light source. It appears purple or violet, and there is UV light that you cannot see. It is the UV light that is important for photoresist exposure, and the lamp is carefully calibrated so that a precise amount of UV light is emitted during exposure. Now that exposure is complete, we remove the wafer, our wafer is now referred to as exposed. We are now ready for the next step, which is developing the photoresist. To make the photoresist show the pattern on the substrate, we develop the photoresist wafer using a chemical called developer. We pour developer into a dish. The developer for any particular photoresist is suggested by the photoresist vendor. The important point to remember for this photoresist is that the developer will selectively dissolve away the portions of the photoresist that were exposed to UV light. This is called positive photoresist. Some photoresists, called negative photoresists, behave in the opposite manner. The UV exposed areas are the areas that are not removed by the developer. Let's continue with our positive photoresist process now. We place the wafer in the developer. The development process takes 60 seconds. Slight agitation during development will ensure a uniform process. After 60 seconds, we remove the wafer and rinse with deionized water, then blow dry with compressed nitrogen. We have successfully performed photolithography. Let's take a look at our patterned wafer under the microscope. We will now inspect the wafer to ensure we have produced a quality pattern. Great. We have a nice pattern. The photoresist looks just like the pattern on the photo mask. Now, we will transfer that pattern into the silicon using a silicon etch. The silicon that is not covered with photoresist will be etched. The silicon covered with photoresist will be protected and thus not be etched. The etching process is performed using a separate dedicated instrument called the reactive ion etcher. The entire process takes about 30 minutes and won't be shown in this video. Here is the etch sample. The silicon has been etched in the areas that were not protected by the photoresist. Let's remove the photoresist using an acetone solvent. Now, we can see that we have a copy of our photo mask on the silicon wafer. Several microns of silicon have been etched away. We cannot see the depth of the etch clearly using an optical microscope, so we can use a scanning electron microscope to get a better look. Here, we can see the mass pattern has been transferred to the wafer, and we can measure how deep the pattern was etched into the silicon. Thanks for joining me today to learn about photolithography.